Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome to the Sportlight Podcast. On this week's Sportlight Podcast, we're going to celebrate a milestone that we hit. Last time was our 100th episode of the Sportlight Podcast, so we wanted to take a little trip down memory lane and share with you five or six of our favorite clips. Now, as we went through and listened to all the podcasts again to try to select our favorites, It was super, super hard. So favorites might not be the best word for this, but we just wanted to give those who have just come upon our podcast a little bit of a flavor for what the podcast is all about. And we thought that these five or six clips that we're going to share will give you a good flavor and make you want to go back and listen to some of those interviews. The interviews we do are not time sensitive. The ones we did two years ago are just as relevant as the one that we'll do coming up in a couple of weeks. And so to go back and to binge listen to our podcast will be very beneficial for any parent and any athlete. We just wanted to expose you who've just come upon our podcast to those that we've done in the past. We hope you enjoy our celebration of our 100 episodes of the Sportlight Podcast. Welcome to the Sportlight Podcast for parents, coaches, and athletes. The Sportlight refers to the time in an athlete's life when they have increased ability to affect the culture around them and the increased opportunity to learn life's lessons through sports. This podcast aims to help parents and coaches capitalize on their athletes' precious time in the Sportlight. The Sportlight Podcast is brought to you by Especially for Athletes program. All right. So one of our favorite interviews was with Super Bowl champion, U of U safety and pro bowler, probably future NFL Hall of Famer, Eric Weddle. And man, I I know this is such a good interview. The reason is, is because as I went through it and tried to find a clip, one of my favorite clips, I felt like I just wanted to copy and paste the whole interview in there. And so it occurred to you to go back and find this one and listen to the whole interview. But in this clip, Eric starts talking about the price of greatness and he starts talking about his routine and what he was most proud of when he retired. Right. And so this is where he's talking about the sacrifices he made and what he did in order to become the athlete, the person and the teammate that he was. And it was awesome. So here's just a clip. Some of our favorite portions of this episode, like I said, the whole thing, we could have just cut and pasted it. It's episode 19 with Pro Bowl safety, Eric Weddle. So when I think back of my career, uh, I think back at the relationships. I think about how hard I worked and how I got every ounce of ability out of this body, mind, soul uh, every day. I never took a day off. I never took a day for granted. And, you know, when I talk about how I was as a football player. I still have those principles. Now I want to be the best 12 U head coach in the entire country. Right. Because if you're not going to do something, if you're not going to try to be the best at it, what is the point? You know, I, I, I despise the word average or good for that matter. Are you, I'm not okay with being good. You shouldn't be okay with being good. Good is average. You know, there's millions and millions of people that are good at what they do, but who are the great ones? That's what I wanted to be. That's what I strive to be in every facet of my life, whether it's being a husband, whether it's being a father, whether it's training my dog, whether it's being a coach to these boys. And I'm not perfect by any means. I make mistakes every day, like everybody else. Uh, But that doesn't mean I'm not trying to be great at everything I do. So, uh, by having that mindset, it was, it resonated and and went through every facet of my life. I wanted to be a great teammate. I wanted to be the greatest safety ever that season. Right. And what it took to do that. I wanted to be a great husband, a great teammate, a great friend, uh, and all those things, uh, made it that, that I would, I think all those things correlated to having a long career because of where I put my priorities. The only thing's holding you back is, is doing the work. And that's really what separates the good and the great ones. The ones that are willing to do it and the other ones that do the minimum. And it's no different at the highest levels, right? The reason I played for as long as I did and had as much success I did as an individual 
One, there are a number of reasons. One is I outworked everybody. It, not only on my team, but when I stepped on that field, everyone across from me, I knew I outworked them. I knew that nobody in the league was getting up at 5 a.m., working out, rehabbing, eating, meetings, working out again after practice, meetings, then at the end of the night, rehabbing and working out again. And then watching film by myself till eight o'clock at night, eight thirty, and getting home and my kids are asleep. I hadn't even seen them all day. There was nobody, nobody doing that. So on, I I had to leg up on that on the competition immediately just because I outworked them. Right. So so to say that oh I was just talent. My talent was better than everyone. well I, yeah I am talented but. I outworked every single person in there. I put in more into my profession than anybody else because I wanted to be great. I wanted to make the most of this opportunity because at the end of the day, I'm living my dream out, right? To sit, to sit here and say that Eric Weddle, I, if I told you you were going to play 13 years in the NFL, you had great success. You would end up having a healthy, long career. When I was in high school, I would have said, there's zero chance of that. There's no chance. I don't believe you. I would pay millions of dollars before I believe that, right? And then when that actually happens, I told myself every day that there's not a day that goes by that I shouldn't have a smile on my face and outwork and do everything possible to make this dream the most it could be because I am living my dream out, right? How many people can say they're living their dream out. Not many. So if you have that chance or you have that opportunity, high school football is a dream of yours. Well, let's make the most of it. If you want to play college football, it's a dream of yours. Go make it happen, right? And you'll have help along the way, but it's going to be on you, right? You're going to determine and make that decision if you want to do the work, if you want to sacrifice everything to make that goal happen. And... That's one of the main reasons, obviously, my wife, my faith, my priorities, staying true to, to what my mindset was helped along the way, get staying healthy. But I think staying healthy was because I worked so hard and I did the work. So is that hand in hand or the guys that are always injured? Is it because they don't take care of their bodies? I don't know. I don't know. That's only for them for the decide. But I just go off of my experience and. Uh, at the end of the day, if you put the work in, you'll reap the benefits. All right. That was an incredible episode by Eric Weddle. We love that one. Go back and listen to that one if you've never heard it. The next one is a little bit more serious in nature. We're so grateful that we've had on our podcast twice, Max Hall, former BYU and NFL quarterback. Max is very transparent with his story. He came on in episode, let's see, six and 54. And in those two episodes, he talked about drug addiction. Many of us have people in our life who've been impacted by drug addiction. In episode six, he has a conversation with us and tells us this story. And then in episode 54, he speaks at one of our banquets and he just lays out his whole story. Once again, as I was listening to Max tell his story, it was so hard just to cut a little portion of it. The story was so engaging that I forgot that I was listening for, for four or five minutes just to give a sample. But we wanted to hear about Max and why he feels so passionately about the Especially for Athletes program. And we also wanted you to hear his story because you probably have someone in your life who's been impacted by drug addiction. And as he shares his story, it's a, it's a story of hope. It's also a story of warning with great lessons. If you want to hear the full episodes of Max sharing his story and the lessons he's learned, they're episodes 6 and 54. But here's a portion of that banquet speech that he gave to our program. My senior year, towards the end of my senior years, the first time that I was ever introduced to drugs. 
And I remember I, one of my best friends, I'm down in his basement, we're sitting there hanging out, and I noticed some of my buddies going in and out of a room, kind of in the back. So I said, what the heck are they doing back there? I'm gonna go check this out. So I walked into the room, and they got all weird. Shut the door, shut the door. I'm like, what are you guys doing? And they're like, come here. Well, they were taking these oxys, and they were crushing them up, and they were snorting them off of the dresser. And I said, yo, you guys are nuts. You guys are crazy. What the heck are you doing? No, man, just try it. Just try it. It's cool. It's cool. Make you feel great. We're just going to cruise and have a good night. Like, no, I'm not doing that. Come on. Finally, I fell. Finally, I said, all right, give that here. I'll try it. And I did it. And there's three types of people in this world that come to opiates. Number one, it makes you sick. Number two, it makes you fall asleep. Number three, guys like me, that was the best feeling in the world. I felt like I could take a deep breath and all the stress and everything that I was going through as a high school kid just went away. I didn't get addicted to it at the time, but it's important to understand the first time that I was introduced to it was in high school and what that did to me later. That's really important to understand. I got an opportunity to go play in the NFL. Um, went, to, went back home to the Arizona Cardinals and got to start games as a rookie. Um, I eventually suffered two really bad concussions, knocked out cold on the field. And I just wasn't right. And I, I'm sure some of some of everybody, a lot of people in here played football, you know what a concussion feels like. And the depression and the fogginess and everything that goes along with that. So I, I kind of got really depressed at the time. For the first time in my life, I felt depressed. It was a weird. I didn't really know how to handle it. I'm forgetting plays. I remember they kept playing, and I'm forgetting plays at the line of scrimmage. And I just felt like I was going downhill. Uh, I think it was about week seven. Um, I was in the game, took a sack fumble, and I, I reached out for the ball to get it. Someone dove right at my shoulder, and it dislocated my shoulder. So I'm sitting there with my shoulder hanging out of my socket, looking at the sideline like, hey, <laughs> this thing's out. Come on. So they send the trainer out to me. He yanked my arm down into place, put my shoulder back, and they took me back to the locker room. And when I got to the locker room, I sat down. I started bawling. I started crying my eyes out. Because in my mind, football was over. I thought I was done. And I know Dustin uh, kind of touched on this a little bit, and I'm going to tweak it a little bit, okay, Dustin? People say, hey, football's got to be something you do. It can't be who you are. But the reality of it is when you're so passionate about something and you work hard at something, it becomes part of who you are. And football was a big part of who I was. The problem is I let it be the only thing that identified me. Being a quarterback, being a football player, being in the spotlight, you know, playing on Fox, big lights in the, in the NFL. Man, that's who I was. I embraced that. So now I'm thinking that it's over, and I don't know how to deal with it. I don't know what to do. I don't know who I am. I'm in pain, concussion, emotional down. So I go to a doctor, he gives me a 30-day supply of Percocet. And um, I took, took the whole thing in about three days um, because it numbed it out. It took it away. I wasn't worried about anything more, anymore. The physical pain, the emotional pain, everything that I was going through was gone. Well, after three days, I'm like, well, dang it, I gotta find more of this stuff. So guess who I called? My buddy from high school. I said, hey, man, you still doing those pills? He goes, yeah, I got you, bro. Come on, let's go. Well, that buddy has been in and out of prison, and it has totally ruined his life. But I got more pills, and, and off I went in my addiction. It got worse and worse. It became a daily habit. It, became, it got to the point to where I couldn't go four hours is when the withdrawal would start setting in, and I would have to use again. So for five years, I lived in the dark. For five years, the number one thing in my life was finding drugs and using drugs. And then the next day I would do it again. That is a really crappy way to live your life. 
And that's what I did. I still was able to go back to the Cardinals the next year, but I was so hopped up on stuff. Now I'm, I was taking about 350 milligrams of, of oxy a day, which eventually turned into heroin. And now I'm down and I'm trying to get up to play football. So then I got to have stimulants just to keep me awake. So then cocaine, that, everything came into it. Amphetamine, anything that I could get my hands on. That's what I was going to do. I felt like I had to have it to function. And I couldn't see my life without it. That's how dark it got. It was hell. And addiction takes the soul of the addict. And it breaks the heart. I can never get through that part. It breaks the hearts of those who love them. And I broke a lot of hearts. And I caused a lot of damage. And for that, it still it still puts a knot in my stomach. It, it's really hard for me to talk about that. But it took my soul. It almost ruined me. After five years, I, I went up to play in Canada for a little bit. I came back down, and um, one Saturday morning, um, I, I did about 300 milligrams of oxy and a whole, almost a whole eight ball of cocaine. I found myself wandering around at Walmart and wandering around at Best Buy. And I can make fun of myself now, but I'm like putting on headphones in the store. I'm gone. I have no idea what's going on. I'm acting like an idiot in this store. They call the cops. Cops come out and they arrest me. And I vividly remember, not much about that day, but I do remember them putting handcuffs on me and shoving in the back of the police car. And I remember that door getting slammed shut. Boom. And here I am sitting in the back of a police car with my hands cuffed, thinking that's it. I'm done. I'm going to lose my family. I'm going to lose my friends. No one's going to want anything to do with me anymore. I'm a drug addict. I just got arrested. Cocaine and paraphernalia on me. Are you kidding me? How did I go from being the quarterback at BYU, starting quarterback for the Arizona Cardinals, to a drug addict, arrested in the back of a police car. I'm telling you what, addiction doesn't care who you are, doesn't care how much money you make, doesn't care how good you are at football, it'll come after you if you let it. And it destroyed me. I remember that was on a Saturday, Monday was a holiday, Tuesday hit the press. And Twitter, I was on every front page of the newspaper, news station, I'm, people are making fun of me, they're making memes, they're going, you know, I was embarrassed. I, I wanted to just go away, so I remember Tuesday morning when it came out, and I found out about it. I can't remember exactly what parking lot I was in, but I, I remember sitting down on a curb in this parking lot, and for the first time in my life, I didn't think it was worth going on anymore. I thought, I'm just going to end it right here. I'm going to figure it out. But for the first time, I thought about killing myself. It was the lowest point in my life sitting on that curb. I felt alone. I felt scared. Felt like I had lost everything. That's what it did to me. No confidence. I didn't know what to do. I turned my phone off because I was getting texts and stuff like that, so I turned my phone off. Something in me said, turn your phone back on. When I turned my phone back on, the first call that I got was from Brandon Doman. For, for you coaches and administrators and leaders, you have no idea the effect, well maybe you do, the effect that you can have on young kids. Brandon Doman called me up. He was my guy, he was my coach. 
He taught me everything about how to be a quarterback and how to be a good person. Called me up and he said, Max, we got you. Get on a plane. Get up here to Utah. We're going to take care of you. I said, okay. I guess that's what we're doing. So I flew up. They got me to a rehab center. I spent 90 days in the rehab center. The first two weeks I was in withdrawal, kicking, hot and cold sweats. I can't stop throwing up. I'm shaking. It's like, imagine the worst flu you've ever had times by 10. That's what, that's what I'm going through right now. And I wouldn't answer the phone because I thought Kenzie was going to leave me. I thought she was out. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't take any messages. I wouldn't talk to her. I didn't want to do it. I couldn't face it. So my counselor says, Max, get on the phone and talk to your wife. And when I got on the phone and talked to her, she said, babe, I love you. And if you're willing to fight, I'm willing to fight with you. And she stuck with me. And that gave me a little bit of hope. And so I said, okay, or uh, maybe I can get through this. Maybe I can overcome it. Friends, coaches started coming to visit me in there. I had to make a choice. And I decided I was willing to do anything and everything that I had to do to get sober and to change my life around. This anxiety thing that I'm talking about, I'm going to give you a good idea. This is actually from Kenzie, and this is awesome. This is this explains anxiety. If you've never suffered or you've never had anything, let me explain it to you. And I want you to think about these high school kids as I do, because this is some of the things that they're going through. Having anxiety and depression is like being scared and tired at the same time. It's the fear of failure, but no urge to be productive. It's wanting friends, but hating socializing. It's wanting to be alone, but not wanting to be lonely. It feels like everything at once, and it feels like you're numb. Everything is happening, but you're numb to it. You can't function. And that, that, that's how I was, and that's how a lot of these high school kids are. That's one great thing that I have about a coach. X's and O's and great are great. And me and Dustin could sit up and draw plays at 2 in the morning all night long. But the best part about my job is mentoring these high school kids, is coaching them and teaching them to have high character, to make good choices, and to serve the people around them, to help other kids. That's what it's all about. That's what E4A is all about. So I love what we're doing here. Like I said, this is a movement. This is much needed. Hopefully you guys realize how many kids are struggling with this. Having been at the point where I thought about suicide, I can't remember the stat, Dustin, but there's a lot of kids out there committing suicide. Why? What are they going through? What's going on at home? What's going on with their friends? Do they have somebody to talk to? Do they have a coach or a mentor or somebody that can help them? That's what we're trying to do, right? That's what it's all about. We're going to teach these young men and young women how to grow up and how to be successful in whatever endeavor they go into in life. All right. So that was such a touching episode with Max Hall. We hope you'll go back and listen to both of those. Just as a reminder, episode six and episode 54, that was only half the story there. And to hear Max tell it is just super engaging. And if you have someone in your life who's struggling with addiction, or if you are, it will bring a lot of hope that people can change and and that they could overcome their addiction. He talks about an organization that he has, a podcast he has. And so take a look at the show notes of those two episodes. But that was just one of our ones that really made an impact. And we got a lot of feedback from that. And that was just a little little sampling of that. So the next one was with cross-country coach at BYU, Diljeet Taylor, and Julie Sumption, a cross-country runner there at BYU, which if you don't know, is one of the best track and cross country long distance colleges in the country. They are constantly one of the top ranked universities. And so, so we wanted you to hear just a portion of Diljeet and Julie 
talking about how running builds resilience and they compare running to life. And one of our main topics is resilience when we go and meet with teams and and speak to schools and athletic departments. We talk a lot about how sports can help you to develop resilience. And they share this concept of pushing through the dark place. And we loved it. So here's just a sample. Diljeet Taylor and Julie Sumption. If you want the whole episode, it's episode 72. But this is one of our favorite parts of the first 100 episodes that we've done. And so we hope you enjoy this little portion. I'm curious, what is going on in the mind of a elite runner when they start to feel pain and they want to keep going? Um, so we actually just had a race on Friday and I remember, you know, towards that last mile, it starts to get really hard and you feel that pain and something coach Taylor tells us all the time. And this came to my mind is she says, do you want to be good or do you want to be great? And I remember thinking that with a mile to go is okay. I can stay here where I'm comfortable and I can be good or I can keep pushing and embrace the hard and I can strive for greatness and try and be great. And so I just kept telling myself, or I guess asking myself that question over and over and over that whole last mile. Um, and so that's something that I took and used to help me as the race got really hard. And I was trying to go to that dark place. Yeah. I mean, I think we talk a lot about the dark place in this program and the willingness to everybody wants it, right? Everybody wants to, to have the outcome, but there has to be a will, a willingness to go to that dark place so you can have that desired outcome. And oftentimes our mind quits well before our body does. It's the mind telling the body that it can't, that it hurts, that it's painful. And so I think when, you know, you get to that point, you really have to silence the mind. Um, you have to silence the mind so the body can do its job. And, and some of that is embracing that dark place of racing. And whether that happens in the second you know, half of the race, whether that doesn't happen until the last 800 meters of the race, whether you get there in the first 800 meters of the race, every single athlete is going to have a, a meeting with the dark place. And it's, are you willing to go through it? Or are you going to back off and stay in your comfort zone? And and we know real growth doesn't happen in comfort zones. And so I think one of the advantages that our program has at BYU is the women are willing to go to the dark place. And then they're willing to live in that dark place and embrace it and get comfortable in that dark place. Um, there have been races, both Julie and I, uh, have not went to the dark place. Right. And, and, and most runners know what I'm talking about when you talk about that races that get really uncomfortable or they didn't go as planned and you just decided to take your foot off the gas and stay where it was comfortable. If your teammates are leaving you, you decide not to go cause you're already hurting. Um, and you feel a lot more pride when you're willing to go to that dark place. And in order to do that, you, you really have to have a decision already made before you enter the dark place. So that commitment has to come before the gun goes off. Hmm. Will you describe for me being a non-runner? I, th I know runners will probably know exactly what you're talking about when you say the dark place. <laughs> would, would you describe what that's like when you encounter the dark place in running? Oh boy. Um, yeah, I think the best way to describe the dark place is the moment that doubt enters your mind and you have to ask yourself, do I really want this? And can I actually do this? Um, because once that doubt creeps into your mind, it kind of consumes you almost in a race. Um, and so that dark place is as you get closer and closer and closer to that doubt, um, and that extremely hurtful place where you just don't know if you can keep going. Would you? Yeah. yeah. I think it, it, there's, there's a mental aspect to the dark place that you have to wrap your head around. And then there's the physical aspect of the dark place where your legs are throbbing, your chest is pounding, you're 
really in, in, on the pain train. You've decided to hop on the pain train and now you've entered the dark place. It's almost like you're on that train and you're going through this dark tunnel and most people don't come out of that dark tunnel. But if you can withstand the dark place, there is light on the other side. And that is what we call the finish line. The feeling that you're going to get when you cross that finish line, it, it becomes light again. And the women that are willing to go there see extraordinary results and we have to teach that. You have to teach people to get to that. Some people innately have that ability built in more than others, um, but it's something that can be taught, which is the greatest thing about our sport. You, you can always get better. You can always teach yourself to be a little more uncomfortable, to go a little more dark. Um, we talk about it a lot. We, we visit it often in practice so that when it comes around in a race, we're more likely to you know, have a familiar feeling with that and be able to overcome it. But there's a meeting of the mind and a pain in the body and a pounding in the chest. And you, you will know when you have entered the dark place. <laughs> so those are some great thoughts on the dark place. I thought they explained that well. And, and it really leads into maybe a barrage of clips. I want to play here for a second. One of the things we like to do on this podcast when we have elite athletes come on is we ask them about the price of being great. And we have them get into their routine and what they do and how they became who they became. And so I just wanted to play a few clips here that will give you a little flavor for for that. And the first one comes from a mental performance coach of the Tampa Bay Rays, Justin Sua. And Justin talks about the price of becoming great. And then we'll introduce a few other clips. But this is just one that's so motivating. We find ourselves playing it a lot and letting athletes hear someone whose business is helping athletes become their best selves and perform at the highest levels. And he shares some things that we love to share. So here's a sampling. This comes from one of our first episodes, episode 17. You'll love it. Justin Sua mental performance coach of the Tampa Bay Rays. I'm just wondering, as you've worked with all these people, I mean, in the military and professional sports, and what are some of the things you've learned about the price that it really takes for someone to, to excel at their trade, whether it's sports or whatever, but I'd love to hear your yeah. thoughts. I think that's a, that's a really, really good question because I think when you see these athletes on television or you see their highlight films, what you don't see is all the blood, sweat, and tears they put into it before they started to perform under the lights. All the, all the failures they experienced, all of the injuries they had to overcome, all the hours and hours and hours they, they embraced – in order to perform at the extremely high level. And what's really interesting is a lot of people, especially youngsters, they under, even adults, when you set a goal to be great at what you do, a lot of people underestimate how hard it's gonna be and how long it's going to take. And to what to your point, what you just said, if you want to be excellent, if you want to be at the tip of the spear, upper echelon, you need to embrace the boredom of consistency. You need to know that it is going to be boring. It is going to be hard. It, you are going to have to do things when nobody is watching. And you got to ask yourself, am I willing to pay the price of, of achieving my goals? Whatever, whatever it is, in school, in sports, in relationship, a lot of people set the goal or they want to commit to the destination without considering what it's going to take to get there. And so if you're going to set a high goal for yourself, that's great. But make sure you take into consideration the lifestyle that's required to achieve that goal. And I think that's where a lot of people end up tripping up. It's, it's, I've seen it many times after an NFL football game, players going back onto the field when the cameras are gone so they can work on their drills or work on their moves. I've seen baseball games end at midnight and players, baseball players setting up a tee and going in and continuing to hit over and over again. I've seen it snowing outside and players going outside to get extra work. Mom and dad didn't tell them to do it. Coaches didn't tell them to do it. They went out there to do it because that's what professionals do. 
do. There's a phrase that the Navy SEALs say, uh, you don't rise to the occasion, you sink to the level of your training. And it comes down to your training. How much are you willing to work? And I think Kobe Bryant is is one of the best examples that can't believe um, he's not with us anymore. But you just go back and read stories about his work ethic. Read about Kobe Bryant's work ethic. And people say that they thought they worked hard until they saw what Kobe Bryant did and or Michael Jordan or just the elite of the elite. They put in the work. They paid a price. And once again, I'll return back to that phrase. You have to be willing to embrace the boredom of consistency day after day. It's supposed to be hard. It's supposed to be difficult. But you signed up for the hard road the moment you decided to commit to going after your dreams. Oh, that's awesome, Justin. I love that. Embrace the boredom of consistency. Yeah. There's a lot of people, I think, who want to be good at sports, so they do all the fun stuff. In my experience, it's like the the T work. That's not as fun as just taking BP and seeing if you can hit it over the wall. Uh, and it's that that boredom of consistency that make people great. That's a, that's an awesome phrase. I we use a phrase, and especially for athletes, it's called "win the hour." I love what you say because embracing the boredom of consistency. Like truly winning the hour is not just doing stuff. It's, it's learning what's most valuable, uh, what's going to have the best benefit for, your, for athletics, for your social life, for your academics or whatever. And, and embracing that and really like, I know this is boring, but if I consistently do this, that's what leads to greatness. And so yeah, there's a lot of great, there's a lot of a meat with what you said. Uh, first off, what you were talking about is doing the hard thing. I think that is incredibly important. And then into this concept of winning the hour, I, I like that. One thing we, we talk about in our, in our industry is there's 86,400 seconds in the day, 86,400. It doesn't matter what grade you're in. It doesn't matter what sport you play. It doesn't matter what country you live in. It doesn't matter how rich or how poor you are, what you look like. Everyone is given 86,400 seconds a day. And what separates the best from the rest, or even the best version of you from the worst version of you, is how you decide to use those seconds. And they go by fast. They go by so quick. You're inviting these youth. You're inviting these parents. You're inviting anyone involved in your program to do what they do on purpose, with purpose, to live a life by design and not by default. Because if you don't plan your day, if you don't plan to go 16 to 0, the default mechanism is we're a creature. We want the easy way. Chances are, if you're listening to this and you're a teenager, you've asked your teacher, what's the least amount I have to do to get an A? What's the, le- what's the least amount I have to do? Hey, coach, can we do something so we don't have to condition? What can we do to take it? It's like, we want the easy route. We're cutting corners. We're not touching the line. And that's not what elite people on elite athletes or humans do. It's embracing the difficult thing. It's leaning into the hard thing because that's what's going to set you apart, not just set you apart from others, but get you inch you closer and closer to the best version of yourself. All right. That's some great stuff from Justin Sua. And we love those phrases, embrace the boredom of consistency. And if you sign up for greatness, you need to realize the price of being great. And a lot of our young people don't understand that price. And it's not because they're lazy. It's just, they don't understand the level that some people are willing to work in order to achieve their goals. And they think they're working hard because they just go to their practices. And so one of the things we focus on throughout all the podcasts, and you could go back, you could listen to our podcast with Wally Joyner, with Olympic swimmer, Ryan White, with volleyball player, McKenna Miller, with, with, Peyton Henry, who just broke into the major leagues a while back, it is going back and forth between minors and majors. And with our next one that we'll play here, Tyler Hawes, you can listen to all these episodes and we almost always ask them to help us understand the price of being great at their sport and what they have done to achieve that. Here's just a sample, just one of them. We aren't going to play you a whole hour of them, but if you go back over the podcast, any athlete that we interview, you're going to hear them talk about 
the price they paid to try to become great at their craft. But here's Tyler Haas explaining the price he paid at a young age to become the all-time leading scorer at Brigham Young University, to play professional basketball, and to accomplish all of those. So here's Tyler Haas and his story. I would just wonder, what do you have to say to people who really would love to be great, whether it's sports or in business or in life? What have you learned through playing basketball about the price of of achieving greatness and achieving your goals? Yeah, great question. Um, Yeah, I think this is something that everyone can relate to no matter what what you're chasing in life, if, if it's sports or academics or something in business or anything, um, you know, to be successful and to win there, there's a price that has to be paid. Right. And, you know, it, there's another saying that it, it takes what it takes. Right. And so I don't know. I, and I've, I've had to learn, I haven't been perfect at that, uh, in my life. I, I've, learned the hard way a couple of times that, you know, thinking that maybe you're better than you are, or, you know, thinking you can walk into a gym and, and beat a team. Um, but the times when, uh, you know, my, my preparation met opportunity, um, really has, those were some special moments when, when I did put in the right preparation and I did, um, put in the right work and sacrifice the right way. Um, and, and then the right opportunity presented itself and I was ready for it, you know? Right. And so you know, my, my high school coach, that, that was the formula he always preached is, Hey, we're, we're when preparation meets opportunity, that's when special things happen. And so, um, I, I've tried to live by that. Um, uh, definitely haven't been perfect, but I think in whatever you're chasing in life, it's about, it's about paying that price and, and wanting it. You gotta, you gotta want success and want to win, um, more than the, the guy next to you that's, that's chasing the same thing. Right. And so, I don't know. Those, those were, that's kind of been my approach and still fine tuning those things and trying to, trying to get better every day, um, at, at chasing, chasing that next win. Well, and and to that point, Tyler, share with us some of the, um, habits or routines that you maybe implemented. Uh, and, and I don't know if you started, you know, really buckling down your, your habits and routines in junior high or high school, or was there a time where you realized, okay, I'm, I'm pretty good. I think I have a a chance here. Um, and, and, and when that was, what, what would a typical morning or day or afternoon look like as far as, as preparation for you that you think might, might help a, a young man or woman listening to this? Yeah. So, I mean, for me, I, I remember being in, you know, fifth or fifth or sixth grade, I went to a very basketball camp and, um, and it came out of it with, I I think I was the MVP of the camp and it was the first time that, you know, I had put in some, some work and started getting in the gym, shooting in the backyard, just doing some simple things. And it was kind of the first time where I was like, wow, like I, I, I was the MVP of the camp. I, I've got a chance to be pretty good. And, and that success and motivation kind of became addicting to me. And I was like, all right, I'm, I'm going to put together a plan because I, I want to do it again. I want to replicate this. And so I, you know, it, it, and it changed year to year. But, um, you know, from sixth, seventh, eighth grade, I was, I was shooting a couple hours in the morning and, you know, there were some days where I was trying to put up 500 shots. There were some days I was trying to put up 750 shots, you know, and I, I'd write them out. I had a journal. I keep track of, you know, what I was, how many, I was, how many shots I was making on a certain drill. And, and then I try and beat it the next morning. Um, so, but I, 
so I'm, I'm getting sidetracked here, but I, I, I'd shoot for two hours. I'd go home, eat breakfast, um, you know, hang out, do my chores. And, and then I'd go back to the gym and I'd dribble. I'd dribble for an hour. I had a, a big routine, a dribbling routine. And then I'd try and get, uh, try and get guys together in the afternoon and play one on one, two on two, three on three. And, um, and, and then you know, when I got into high school, I, I added in, you know, lifting in the afternoon. And so by, you know, you get to the end of a day and you, know, you, you put in, you know, five, six hours of work and, um, I think the, those hours in the gym just started compounding over and over and that really the success I saw became addicting and made me want to do more and, and find areas where I could really improve and, and get better. And so, um, it, it, those, <laughs> that, that was the fun part, the journey of trying to figure out, Hey, how can I, how can I get to the next level? How can I, how can I get better? And, and really that fueled my, my confidence in games and on the court and on my teams. All right. So there's Tyler Haas, by the way, that's episode 36. And like we said, any episode that you find with an athlete, we've asked similar questions to, but you know, if you're familiar with our program that we aren't all about just using sports to teach life lessons and using sports to help people develop work ethic. We aren't all about helping athletes become the best version of themselves that they can and the best athletes that they could be. That is a huge part of our program, but really the crux of our program comes down to the name of this podcast. The name of our book is called the sport light. And that is the extra attention that is given to athletes because they are athletes and that puts them in a position to use that attention that comes to them to lift and help those around them. So I wanted to end this trip down memory lane and just with, with three guests that we had. The first one is Chad Lewis, all pro tight end, former great BYU tight end and current associate athletic director at Brigham Young University. He joined our podcast in episode 12, and him and Dustin talked about this concept of the power of the jersey or what we like to call the sport light. And he talked about how athletes could use their position to help and lift other people and shared some thoughts on that. After Chad, you're going to hear Ryan White, Olympic swimmer, world champion ryan talked about a saying that she says to herself that she has written on her mirror it was after our podcast was over and she took us into her bathroom and showed us everything that was written on her mirror and we just kept recording and we thought well this would make a great episode but one of the things that she wrote on there is really profound and fits right into our motto of eyes up, look for people who need you and do the work. And then finally, we had the first lady of Utah, Abby Cox, on our podcast a couple of times. And Abby shared in episode 92 of an experience that she had with a young person and then shared her thoughts on our program. So the next three voices that you'll hear Chad Lewis, and then Ryan White, and then Abby Cox. Just listen to these. This is another thing we do in our in our podcast, and we would love these parts of our podcast to lead to discussions that you might have with your teammates or if your parents and coaches with your with your young people. So here they are: Chad Lewis, Ryan White, Abby Cox. The second book is titled the power of the jersey, how we all have influence with each other. And that influence is really a two-edged sword of power. It can cut for good or bad. And so, you know, I, I liken it to a football player at a high school who, if he understands that power, 
And that influence, he can do a ton of good. He can lift people's lives. He can help them smile. He can, he can spread light in a way that changes lives. Or he can be a punk or a bully or making fun of people all the time. And his power now is using the wrong side of that sword. He's cutting you know, limbs and joints off of people. He's cutting confidence out of people. He's, he's doing great harm. And he won't figure it out for years to come. But parents are figuring out right now. And they're seeing their kids being destroyed by bullies. And that's not cool. So that image to me of sharing the power of the jersey and what you call the sport light, which I think is such a great term, share your gifts and blessings with other people. Make a conscious decision to be a leader Make a conscious decision to be nice, to be cool, to understand that you have influence, whether you know that or not, and use that influence to walk down the hallways and lift other people. You don't have to be a phony. You don't have to be a molly about it. But you got to reach out. So maybe you're a quiet leader. You still need to open your mouth. You still need to say some things. And sometimes it's not acceptable just to be a silent leader you got to speak so yeah of course i have actually one other thing um and like one of the that you texted was like how have i been able to use my platform or position to like lift and help others and i called my mom because i was like i feel like i haven't i haven't done any clinics yet i haven't done any like specific events and my mom like brought she's like you do stuff all the time and i was just kind of struggling to find the answer i guess and she like brought up um when i was a junior we had like we had like a banquet at the end of each um season and they gave me like mv mvp towels each time i mean not every time it was some sort of like award with my name on it like embroidered um like on a towel because we're somewhere so those are our trophies sometimes (laughs) Um, creative I was like, Mom, I don't want this towel. I have so many towels. And she was like, give it to someone. And I gave it to a girl on my team who, I don't know how old she was. Um, She was much younger than me in the younger group. And I I just kind of got the feeling that she struggled with finding her group and finding her friends. And every time that I've gone home to train with my team, she's so excited to see me. And I think she just thinks I, like, walk on the water. And... It's just really crazy, like, my mom pointed it out to me, but I think I've made a very big impact on her life. And even she came to Alabama. She wasn't, she's not, like, swimming in college, but she's just going, she was going on, like, tours of different schools. And I had a dinner with her and her mom while she was in town. And it was just really cool to see. We were, we weren't really friends, but I gave her this towel and she had looked up to me. But now it's like we are almost friends. And it's like I know, she knows she can call me if she needs something. And she knows that I will be there if nobody else is. And I think that's, like, really cool. <laughs> um, I have, like, in my mirror in my bathroom, I'll show you there, um, a note. And it says, like, I'm, like, really into just decorating stuff like this. But it says, like... This is says Project 48, so that's, like, my goal time. These are my, t- my like, pace times for the 200. But this is a saying that I really like from a, I think it's, like, a boxer or a fighter. So they'll see you at the top. So that's something I really like. Um, so this one is, like, the one that's, like, standing out to me right now. Is like, be who you needed when you were younger. Um, I don't know. That's just something that, like, is another way of saying, like, eyes up, do the work is because, yeah. like, you're just looking who needs you, and if they're younger than you, they might have needed somebody like you at the time. So that's something that I, like, I really like. Um, that's awesome. Yeah. That's, that's, be, that's, <laughs> I'm going to add that a little bit. Yeah, be who you needed when you were younger. Is yeah. What a, man, right. That's, that's great. <laughs> There was a, let me, another experience of, a, of a, a student that I talked to. He was a former student. He had graduated from high school. And I was talking to him, and he said, 
I was asking him about his experience. I said, were you, what was your experience in high school? Were, were you bullied? He said, no, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't bullied. And he, he had a physical disability. He didn't have an intellectual disability, but he was kind of ex- explaining his, his experience to me. And he said, I wasn't really bullied. He said, but, you know, people, people were friendly. Is what he said. People were friendly, which was great. I'm thinking that's great, you know. And then he says to me, there were times when my mom and I would make cookies and I would sit on my front porch with a sign that said, will you be my friend? And that literally broke my heart. I mean, I was just crying, thinking of of my child being that person sitting on the porch asking if somebody will be his friend. And um, what he said to me, and I will never forget this, and I've repeated it a hundred times. He said to me, people are friendly, but they weren't my friend. Mm -hmm. And what I'm seeing is with these, these leaders, these athlete leaders, when they when they start to participate in unified sports, when they start seeing, you know, eyes up doing the work, when they start seeing um, people that are different from them or the people that they perceive have, have different abilities than them, um, when they see them as humans and as a friend, um, they, they are completely changed and their hearts are completely changed and opened. And, um, so what I'm seeing is not just, you know, uh, you know, and I've had several of, of, you know, parents of children with disabilities say to me, you know, my kid's never been invited to a birthday party. And I, I mean, as a parent, you, I mean, you know, when your kid's been, you know, your daughters come home and friend didn't invite or friend didn't say this or this problem. I mean, believe me, I have a 16 year old girl right now. I know what your, what your kids are coming home with. Um, but that instance where they have never had a friend, people have been friendly and that's great. We don't want bullying, but there's a step beyond that. There's a step beyond that, that your leaders, your athletes, can help to make happen. There's a step where not only can you be friendly, it's going to take one more step and it's going to be, this person is going to be my friend. I'm going to invite them to things. I'm going to have them at my birthday party. I'm going to have them at a get together with my buddies from my football team. Um, And what we're seeing when, when this happens is we're seeing a complete change in the, in the atmosphere of, of our students, of our schools, of our communities, and people are coming together and rallying around um, these kids together as a team. I love those concepts that are right at the heart of the message of Especially for Athletes. There is power in the jersey. We call it the sport light. We need to be for others what we needed when we were younger. We love that from Ryan and, of course, Abby Cox. Will you be my friend? There are kids who need people to reach out to them. They need friends. That's our mission. We go around and try to help young athletes become the best athletes they can be. We try to help that sport light to grow as bright as possible. And then we try to help them use that influence, that power of the jersey, that sport light to reach out and to help other people. Thank you for supporting our cause by listening to these messages on our podcast. We do encourage you to go back, listen to those ones you haven't listened to. Every single guest has provided insights that have changed mine and Dustin's life, that have helped us help others, and we know that they'll help you as well. So thank you so much for listening to the first 100 episodes of the Sportlight Podcast. We look forward to the next 100. And as always, keep your eyes up and do the work. This has been the Sport Life Podcast from Especially for Athletes, sponsored by Coca-Cola. You can learn more about Especially for Athletes by visiting the website at especiallyforathletes.org. You can also learn more about the book, The Sport Light, by Shad Martin and Dustin Smith at especiallyforathletes.org slash book.